The boat and RV storage industry, how much that it's growing, square foot per capita. A lot of people do not know how to judge supply and demand. People will go out and they'll pay anywhere from a hundred thousand up to one and a half million dollars for these RVs. And so these people are looking at this as this is how I vacation. I want to take care of this vehicle because in their mind, they're committed to a 20 year loan. Warren Buffett also believes in the boat and RV industry. He bought a company called Forest River RV, which is the biggest manufacturer of RVs in the world. All right, well, thank you everybody for your time, your energy, your attention to come out here. Uh, we'll go ahead and start with the bad news, which is I am not Ann, and if you are here to learn about wine storage, you will not be learning about that today, because I don't even drink wine, okay? So I definitely don't have any wine storage. But uh, the main thing I wanna talk about today is boat and RV storage. I was given 15 minutes, that's turned into 30, so I have a short presentation, and we'll talk about whatever else it is uh, that we wanna talk about. The main thing that I wanted to talk about with you guys today, because I've seen it so much, is the boat and RV storage industry, uh, how much that it's growing. And one of the main things that I want to talk about that I have learned that I want to share with you is how to measure the demand, right? Everybody here who's in storage, we can talk about square foot per capita. We can kind of judge the supply and demand of a market. A lot of people do not know how to judge supply and demand of boat and RVs. And I think that's an important lesson that everybody can take forward. So. With that being said, who am I? Uh, I got started in uh, college. I went to UGA, found a guy who worked for free, started learning the real estate industry. We just stumbled across self-storage, and uh, that's how I got into it, kind of by chance. As of August 10th, I've bought 18 facilities, and I've had three facilities in which the majority of the revenue, if not all of the revenue, came from boat and RV storage rather than uh, traditional self-storage. So I wanna walk you guys through a quick case study first, my first deal. I bought this facility right here, 100% boat and RV storage. Nothing fancy, right? We're talking about a lot in Florida. Most of it's on grass. It had some carports right here, which were not attached, but a lot of uh, uncovered boat and RV storage product. But it did come with these barns right here, which I will get into. I bought this property. It was doing $264,000 a year of revenue. It's 10 acres. I bought it from uh, a guy who wanted to retire. There was no website. He didn't do any marketing and they were drastically below market rates. Uh, in 2022, last year, we took the revenue from 264,000. We did $436,000 of revenue with $170,000 of free cash flow. That was three years after purchase. So I've learned a lot about how do I go in, increase the revenue, increase the value of boat and RV storage facilities. How do we market them and how do we read the market for them? This growth that I've seen in this, in this property has really just opened my eyes to the potential of boat and RV storage and the boat and RV storage industry as a whole. Um, but mainly what I saw in this deal was that the covered spots we had, whether they were those uh, shed mobile carports, whether they were the barns, they were always full and people were always paying a premium for them. And at first I didn't understand, why would somebody pay $300 a month to park their RV under a shed? I didn't get it. Well, the thing that I learned was a lot of these people who were buying, does anybody in here have an RV? Nobody in here has an RV, great. People will go out and they'll pay anywhere from 100,000 up to one and a half million dollars for these RVs. And what I didn't know is that they'll get 20 year loans on these RVs. So people are going and they're buying a $200,000 RV for $5,000 down and $623 a month. And so these people are looking at this as, this is how I vacation. I want to take care of this vehicle because in their mind, they're committed to a 20 year loan. So for them paying $300 a month to, this is in Florida, but even in Georgia, Georgia, Florida, to keep it out of the Georgia sun, the depreciation doesn't happen, their roof seals don't go bad, the interior doesn't get baked. They see the covered boat and RV storage as an investment in the longevity of their vehicle. And I didn't understand that until after I bought this property and saw that we were always full. So I did what any of us would do, and I would say, how can I build more of these canopies on this property that I have? And we call them canopies in the industry, call them covered sheds, really kind of the same thing. Uh, this property I bought was on future land use agricultural. Uh, after a short meeting at the uh, county office, I got kicked out of their office for telling them that it didn't make any sense. Uh, but I learned that I was not gonna be able to do that. So 
I saw the demand, I already had a property, I went land hunting, okay? And that, in the process of going land hunting, I couldn't find any land right there by me because everything was zoned agricultural. I said, how do I know what a good spot to go and build my next facility is going to be? And that's where I learned about judging supply and demand. So in self-storage, who knows this? In self-storage, we measure square feet per capita. Nobody knows that? Raise your hand if you know it. All right, we got half the room. So we're looking at how many square feet of storage is there for every single person that lives within a one, three, five, or 10 mile radius, yes? Everybody knows that? Well, in boat and RV storage, we have to measure stalls per qualifying household. I think it got cut off there. Stalls per qualifying household is what we're looking to measure, not square feet per capita. Okay, so a stall is pretty simple. We have a couple of different kinds of stalls. We have just completely uncovered, like you guys saw, where they're just parking on grass. We have a stall, which is a step up. I think Lisa's got some of this, where people are parking on asphalt, still uncovered. We have the canopies, and then we have completely enclosed units, both non-climate controlled and climate controlled. All of those count as a stall. Okay, so all the different product types, we have, I think, four or five different product types, all of them count as a stall. So according to the RVIA, the Recreational Vehicle uh, Something Association, uh, one in three qualified households owns a storable vehicle, a storable vehicle. One in 13 qualified households. Again, qualified is the major keyword here. So one in 13 qualified in a market on a storable vehicle. Uh, the number of stalls in the market, again, we're not, we don't care how big they are, if they're 20 foot, 30 foot, 40 foot, 50 foot, what kind of stalls they are versus in uh, storage, we care a lot about how many square feet they are and we're kind of lumping it all together there. So a market is not going to be judged by a three mile, a five mile, or a 10 mile radius like self storages. Does anybody know why we can't look at a three, five, 10 mile radius? That looks more like it's that looks where people are going to be moving their stuff on and off the interstate. They don't want to go through downtown traffic areas. That's important too, but one of the other main reasons is these vehicles are movable, right? And people travel to them. So that's correct, is that it's not always about who lives right there by me. A lot of it is about drive time. So from your facility, instead of a three, a five, or a 10 mile radius, we're really worried about a 15 minute drive, a 30 minute drive, and a 45 minute drive. I've got customers at some of my facilities that drive an hour and a half to our facility, and that's because, well, we're on the way north and we only go north out of Florida, so we'll store up here. So we're worried a lot more about drive time and how many potential clients we have within a 15 or a 30 minute drive time than we care about how many people live within a 30 mile radius. And the way roads work, you know, somebody might live two miles from you, but if you've got to go up and around a river, over the interstate and down a bridge, somebody who lives two miles from you may be a 45 minute drive, right? So a lot of it is about drive time as compared to just the how many miles outside of this. So what is a qualified household? A qualified household is a household that makes $62,000 or more a year. $62,000 or more a year. Households under $62,000 may as well not even exist in your search for boat and RV storage customers. Why is that? They don't have enough money to buy a boat. They don't have enough money to buy an RV. Those people are not even inside of our statistics. So the households who make $62,000 or more a year, again, that's a qualified household, one in 13 of those people will have a storable vehicle, whether that be a boat or an RV, okay? So with all of this information in mind, after I learned all of these different stacks of how do I measure supply and demand, I went out and I found my next piece of land, which was this very, very ugly, old industrial park in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, it was a great piece of land, and let's give the numbers on it. It was $1.8 million for the land. It was already paved, which saved me a bunch of money. It had zero dollars of existing revenue. This site was completely vacant. Uh, we did $1.7 million of construction. We built nothing but covered RV storage on this property, these canopies right here, and we built 60,000 square feet of new product right here. And in 2022, 
Uh, we built it for 3.5 million and sold it for 6.2 million. Okay, so that really opened my eyes to, wow, there is a lot of interest, there's a lot of demand, there are serious buyers in the market for boat and RV storage facilities, whether that be your existing self-storage site and you have expansion land and you're just gonna put it in an acre, or whether you do solely boat and RV, uh, we had around 14 different bids on that property, so there was a lot of interest in these property types. Um, so kind of the point that I want to make to you guys is knowing your demand, it's worth you educating yourself on this new product type. I have thought about boat and RV storage as what most people thought about uh, self-storage, say, 15 years ago, when it used to be the red-headed stepchild of the investment world and you could buy it on nine or ten caps. Well, that's kind of how I think about boat and RV storage maybe three or four years ago before it was on everybody's radar. I think it's become on everybody's radar and I think we'll continue to see cap rates for the industry go down and more and more and more of this product being built. Um, and I think that's only going to happen. Do we have any millennials in the room? Cool. You guys are the most RV owning generation ever. Millennials as a percentage buy more RVs than anybody ever has, including the boomers, including anybody else. RVs have blown up in terms of how many people are owning them. And guess what? A lot of these people, they can't, you know, millennials are still renting for the most part, right? They can't park them at their uh, rental house because the HOA, they can't park them at their apartment complex. Most of the people who can park their boats, their RVs, are not the people who are actually buying them, which is leading to the growth and demand of people wanting to store more and more RVs. But that is not just my opinion. Does anybody know who owns Berkshire Hathaway? Nobody does? Nobody? Warren Buffett? Warren Buffett also believes in the boat and RV industry. He bought a company called Forest River RV in 2005, which is the biggest manufacturer of RVs in the world. Okay, so in case you didn't know, Warren Buffett is also hugely behind this trend of RVs being more and more and more popular uh, in the future as a vehicle for people to vacation in, see the country in, whatever it may be. So I hope you guys like that. That was my 15 minute talk and that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to talk about how you choose layouts, how you choose unit mixes, amenities, uh, whatever any of you guys have questions about, happy to dive into it. So the question primarily is, if you've got a facility that's an hour and a half north of where the people are renting the RV, how are you marketing to those people? So what I have done is I have created an additional business for my self-storage property or my RV storage property that will actually go to campgrounds, pick up people's fifth wheel trailers, and we do the valet service. So we'll go, we'll get your RV, we'll bring it back to storage, and when you're coming back into town, we'll take it to your facility for you. And so one of the biggest ways we do that is when we're there in the RV park picking up somebody's camper, these campsites are real tight, right? You ever been there? There's one here, there's one here, there's one here. Well, when somebody pulls up and they say, where's your truck? They go, oh, well, we didn't have a truck because our company delivers it for us. That's a great way that we've gotten a lot of our customers is from these campgrounds and actually doing it for them through the valet service. So whenever we're there, we'll market, we'll hand out cars because most of the people coming into town are coming into town to store. And so they go, wait a second, I can just park it here. I don't have to trailer away. So that's some of our clients, not all of our clients. It's a very seasonal business in the summers in Florida because it's so hot. A lot of your customers that live there there, we'll take their RVs and they'll go north so they're not storing but on the flip side people who have out of town and come here all of those people are storing their RVs so there's kind of this yin yang cycle of people storing their RVs what are we using for a valet service Ram 2500 that's right there's no need for a CDL as long as your load is under I think it's 16,000 pounds yeah I think it is, yep, yep. So we don't do like, you know, the big class A's. We won't drive anybody's rig for them commercially, but you can, tr you can tow a trailer without the CDL. Yeah. fifth wheel. Fifth wheel, yeah, I mean, tra trailers only, right? Uh, class C, which is again, the built-in driver built on a, you know, a Mercedes chassis or a Ford chassis. We're not driving those for people.
For uncovered, it's about 40. For covered, it's about 30 per acre. Yeah, I mean, you'd rather have pull, full, pull through whenever you can, but if you look at the layout of your site, it almost always makes more to butt two together. One of the biggest ways, as some of you guys may know, to really conserve a lot of that space is the optimal layout for your RVs is actually a 60 degree angle. Because if you, if you have, let's say, a 40 foot RV, and if they're pulling in and out at a 90 degree angle, particularly these big class A's, they have to be able to pull all the way out before they can even start to turn, right? If you're parked right next to two others, you have to come all the way out before you can start to turn because it's, it's, a, it's a line. You have to get all the way out. So if you're parking a 40-foot unit, you have to have at least a 50-foot drive aisle. Well, if you put that on an angle, you can still park a 40-foot unit in a 35-foot driveway, and the customers would much prefer it because they don't have to do a seven-point turn to get in and out of their unit, worry about hitting the unit next door, I mean, it's just like when you're parking at Walmart or wherever, imagine if you were pulling in and you had to park at a right angle instead of on the slants. Those slants are a 60 degree angle. You need about 10 more feet than, than the space on a 90 degree angle. If it's a 35 foot parking space, then you're going to need, a, if you're doing 90 degrees, you need a 45 foot drive width. Yeah, but if you have units across from each other, then they can both be served by one drive aisle, right? You talked about adding, you said 1.7 or 1.8 million in additional work, but some of that was retrofitting the old buildings. Yes, so the, these canopies here, um, man, they built 60,000 square feet of these with four guys in about a month. They slap them up. They dig a big hole in the ground. Let me see. You can see right here, they dig a big hole in the ground with a, with a mini excavator, and they just set the post down in there, and they just pour concrete around it, and it is just a really fast process that they whip through, and then they just bolt on the roof here. I want to say turnkey on these, it came out to something like $16 a square foot to build. I, I'd have to double check, but it was definitely less than $20 a square foot to build these, um, these canopies right here. And so you can do other things like a lot of the common amenities. If somebody does have that million dollar RV and they're in Florida, they're in Georgia, they're really worried about mold getting in their unit as they're not there. So these customers want access to power. They want access to uh, at least a 30 amp power, if not a 50 amp power. The more ampage they have, the more of their gizmos and gadgets inside they can run. With a 30 amp power, they can run their dehumidifier. They can make sure not only the exterior of their unit is protected in the shade, they can make sure the interior of the unit is protected as well. Um, but big amenities at projects like this are power at every single slot, and it can get really expensive. If you're serving, this is a 200 unit property, if you're serving 200 different units, Think about running power, 30 amp power, 50 amp power to 200 different units. Your power bill can get expensive. And so I actually found a product called Hawk Scatter. They're out of Mississippi, and they will individually sub-meter out everybody's power usage right from the panel. So you can tell these customers, and what I did is, hey, uh, we've got a spot for you. It's $315 a month. If you want access to the power, it's 20 bucks a month plus whatever your power consumption is. And so that way, you're still getting one power bill, but you can bill out each of those customers' power, and you can get the readings on that remotely. You don't have to go read a meter and install all that out. So I think the Hawk Scatter system on this was something like thirty thousand uh, dollars for all the different people but that's going to make up for itself not only are you charging for the the access to the power but you're not paying for the power right the customers are paying for the power and if you wanted to double that up you'd put solar panels on the roof generate your own power and still sell it to them i didn't do that but i think uh bob haywood out in oakley california uh does that with uh with baja construction so Access to water, uh, you know, we just had a standard bib here, and if they and left a water hose on the ground, if they want to wash their unit off, um, you know, then we had access to that. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're going to see people who want to wash their boats off a lot more than people who want to wash their RVs off. You know, you take a boat out on the water, you want to wash the salt water off. So access to that as a mini is important. Um, and a lot of RV customers want access to a dump station as well. We did not have it here because uh, we did not have access to city sewer um, and you can't get a septic tank big enough to, to do that. Um, 
So that did not deter people. I mean, in, in this market, this is in Fort Myers, people would take any storage they can get. A lot of that's probably just from uh, the growth of Fort Myers in general. Um, but a lot of these places, as people are buying boats and RVs and their HOAs don't allow for it, are pretty desperate to find parking no matter what amenities it has or doesn't have. You know, you'll see a lot of people who will park uncovered as they're waiting for a covered spot to become available because they have to park it somewhere even though they'd rather park it in a covered spot. Yeah. What do you see for Georgia on that side of things? So that was up north, obviously, where you would want to be able to store your fluctuating temperatures. But what does that look like for Georgia? There's, a, there's one of those off of Interstate 75. It's called the RV Loft as you're going up in between, um, I think it's two exits past Truist Field. There's the RV Loft, which does that. They stay completely full. Um, I think it's a great model. I think that the only downside to doing that is you have to buy your building at a really cheap price per square foot because really at the end of the day you're buying a building in which every single square foot is meant to be rented probably triple net and so you're just trying to compare if i were to put an industrial tenant in here versus if i were to do rvs that could park inside what does my revenue look like for the most part it is not economical to go buy a building that could be rented out for you know six dollars a square foot triple net and then you're coming in and you're only utilizing 50% of the space in terms of renting it out, right? So. What's the average uh, stall size? What's the average stall size? Width, 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 width. Yeah, I mean, 12 foot uh, is the width of a road, and so most people can park in a 12 foot space. Uh, the more space you can give customers, the better, and I've seen customers be willing to pay more for a 15 foot wide space. That way they can, work Go, you know, easily access around the outsides of their units. Uh, but the standard is probably 12 to 12 and a half. But you can charge more if you give people a 13 foot space, a 14 foot space. Most common I've seen is 12, 12 and a half, and 15s, width wise. Yep. What's the average duration of time that somebody will rent an RV space? What I see in my facilities, um, you know, we'll have covered spots and the customer will, uh, they'll come in, they'll rent a covered spot, and they'll take their RV out for four months, but they go, we don't want to lose our spot, so we're going to keep renting. And I've seen people, I mean, people have rented since I've had the facility. I bought that first facility with note cards, so I didn't really have the, uh, the length of, of stay on those. But I've had customers who have been there the whole time, and I have other customers who the uncovered spots, which you know, we always find a way to make one available. They'll come in for four months, they'll leave for three months, they'll come back for four more months or however long it is. So it's a little bit different than self-storage. Just say this person stays with us for, or this unit size stays with us for 13 months. These people are coming back, leaving, coming back, leaving. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if they're gone and somebody needs a month rental, I might say, hey, you know, you can, you can park in that spot, but if the other person decides to come back, you have to come move it or whatever it is. So, yeah. Uh, this one right here uh, was unmanned. I didn't, there was no office on it. I didn't build an office. It was a 30-minute drive from... Um, this facility right here, this facility, I bought it. They had staff in place. People raved about them. I kept those people. And again, I needed staff in order to do the valet service. So this is a man site with a husband and wife. They live on property. Uh, she's the manager. He's the valet guy. So, yeah. I think that... Um, you know, I think in the beginning days, I think having a manager on site is important uh, to, to kind of offer that customer service. We're dealing with a much different clientele than traditional self-storage. We're dealing with people who have money, people who want to be serviced, people who want somebody to be there. If they ask, hey, how's the RV doing? They want somebody to be able to say, let me go check on it and call you back, right? Like people just care about their vehicles more than they do grandma's couch being stored in, you know, a unit. So. That's what I found, at least. What type of security are you seeing this best to have around that? And what's, what's the depth of break-in that you see? 
Um, at this property, in four years, I've only had one break-in. Um, they say it was a break-in, a window was broken, but I don't think anything was stolen. Again, we have on-site people who live at this property. Um, but at the other property, we didn't have anybody live there. We just had your standard keypad, gates, uh, you know, a, um, a camera that could read the license plate at the front entry, and that's all we had. Yep. You're putting lights up around the entire facility? Yeah, yeah, both, you know, they're lighted at night, yeah, yep. Gates, cameras, lights. Nothing different than what you'd normally see on a storage facility. What's my time? Yeah, okay. I'll pick up a couple. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so you mentioned six different stall types. You know, when you're doing your build outs, how do you select those six types based on market demand? Yeah, so I think the bigger space you can do is always the better. We have people with 20 foot spaces who will rent a 40 foot space because there was no 20 foot spaces available and they need somewhere to park it. Um, so the bigger the space is always the better. You a lot of times have to look at your lot size, your lot shape, because again, you're worried about, do I have the drive aisle? Can I put these units back to back? And so a lot of it is playing with what works best on your site, but I am always going to lean towards getting the biggest space that I can where I can. Uh, because customers with, again, a, a, you know, RVs come in all different sizes, from a 23-foot Airstream all the way up to a 47-foot uh, Prevo. There's just a lot of different unit sizes, so the bigger you can have is always going to be uh, better. Uh, I mean, I would look at the market. So like in Fort Myers right now, I know a lot about the Fort Myers market, people are renting uncovered spaces for $180 a month, as fast as people can do it. On the flip side, people will rent 50 foot spaces for $500 a month. People will rent interior drive-ins for $1,200 a month. And so I'm just looking at the market, what's occupied, what's not occupied, to try to judge what kind of stalls am I gonna build and what the market's bearing. And then of course, if I can build, you know, if you could build a covered spot for, let's say, $16 a square foot, but a fully enclosed spot's gonna cost you $45 a square foot to build, and the gap there, and you're just saying, what's the difference in the rental income? Is it worth me spending that additional money in order to do so? In some places, a covered spot is, an uncovered spot is $60, and a covered spot's $90. In that scenario, it doesn't make any sense to spend the capital to build the, the units just to generate an extra $30 a month if you're gonna spend a you know, million dollars to get it. So a lot of it's just about economic analysis of what's gonna make the most sense in that market. And I would say, I'd love to put a blanket over it, but you know, I looked at a boat storage in LaGrange, Georgia, and the economics of how much people were willing to pay as a percentage wise of covered versus uncovered is much different than what you'd see in Florida where people are willing to pay four times as much for covered as they are for uncovered. I touched on this a little bit, but this, talk us through the differences, um, if you have more to say about it, between the very large drive-in units and covered units. You know, what makes one uh, easier or harder to build, easier or harder to rent? Yeah, so whenever you're talking about the drive-in fully enclosed, like, um, you know, this, this facility right here, uh, these are fully drive-in units. Uh, when you get into those, not only are you competing with people who just need storage in general, you're also starting to compete with people who are building these and condoizing these. So inside of, in Florida is mainly where I've seen it. I've seen, I think there's a couple here on Lake Oconee. Um, people are starting to build these man caves where it's big enough to pull in, you know, your Porsche, your Prevo and watch the game on, on Sunday in the upstairs loft. People are selling those anywhere from, you know, uh, Miami for over a million dollars to what I'm seeing in Southwest Florida, Punta Gorda, Fort Myers, um, and some here in Georgia. They're selling probably from 180,000 to $300,000. And so a lot of the people who can afford these million, two million, I mean, there are some expensive RVs out there. These guys are going, I don't even want to park under a canopy. I want my RV to sit in a climate controlled area because this thing is almost an appreciating asset because they've got these custom ones, if you've ever seen the movie stars that have custom ones. Um, 
you know, and not only, but they, they, they built a lifestyle out of it, right? They've built a lifestyle out of, I love my RV. We go to game days on Saturdays. We travel the country. This is my home away from home, and I want this to be fully protected. So those people not only are just looking for storage, they're looking for a way to support their lifestyle and their identity, you know, as an RVer. And then there's other people who, you know, have just bought their recreational vehicle. Again, they want to protect their roofs. They don't want their interior to get baked, and their primary concern is, I just want to keep this thing out of the sun, right? And that's my biggest objective with renting the, the covered. So um, do you have anything to add, Brooks, between the What's covered and? I'm sorry? What's your average on these units? These are in South Carolina, and these are, um, I want to say, 30-foot units, and those rent for, I think, 225, something along there. Um, but I was looking at building a fully enclosed it was going to be, I think it was going to be 70 units in Fort Myers, and I was underwriting uh, $1,200 of rent for those in Florida. Yeah. So, it really, again, it really depends on market. It's, it's really dependent upon market. And you just have to think about that logically. You know, if we go to middle of nowhere, Georgia, you're not going to rent any of those, right? Because nobody there has an RV that they want to store. But if we're in Miami or wherever where there's just a lot more affluence, then people are going to be willing to pay, and you're going to rent more of them. So... But I think there's a demand for, for covered storage just about everywhere. I'm not sure that fully enclosed storage is a product that would, that would work in every market. You, you touched on this in your original presentation when you were talking about the 1 in 13 qualified households yep. as a need in a 45-minute drive time, for example. How do you find how many qualified households there are in 45-minute drive time? And then how do you find how many RV units there are in that same space? Yeah, so there's a, a, a demographic company called ERSI um, that you can go in there and it'll give you the, the household demographics of every different income bracket. I think that, the, uh, that you can go look it up for free on census.gov as well for how many people are within each bracket. And um, I forget what service I use that kind of, you can use a service to kind of map out your drive time and how far it is and kind of build different fields of maps of um, these are all your households that are within a 15 minute drive, these are all your households within 30. But the main data company that I know of is ERSI. You can't use, um, you can't use Radius to do it. You mentioned line storage, office suites, business centers, uh, contractor bays, devoted RV. Um, if you had to build a new facility today, we'll use where we are right now as an example. If you had to build a new facility today within 20 miles right here, what would you think about the ideal unit mix being for you know, the various options available to you? I think a lot of the ideal unit mix that you're going to build is dependent on how many square feet you have. I mean, far and away, if the market demanded 5 by 10s and they would fill it all up and we could rent those for 40% more per square foot than anything else, I would do it. Because even in some of the ridiculous numbers, we're talking about $1,200 for a you know, enclosed uh, RV storage, you still look at it on a per square foot basis and it still does not beat traditional self-storage right, on a square foot basis, particularly your smaller units. So you know, if I had a 20 acre site, I would go build 10,000 square foot of you know, 5 by 10s, 10 by 10s, 10 by 15s, 10 by 20s. I'd go build 30,000 square feet of enclosed boat and RV storage if I thought it was an affluent market. I'd build 50 uh, covered parking spaces and gravel the rest to do unenclosed and just open air parking um, and kind of see what would do best inside of the market. The great thing about the unenclosed parking is you can always just tell those people, your 30 days is up, I need you to move your unit and get out of here, we're doing something else with it, right? And so I like that just because there's a lot of optionality um, within that product. I have seen, there's a guy in uh, Cumming, Georgia, um, on Browns Bridge Road, who took some of these canopies, um, some of these right here, I know it's a little dark. This is a, a, a red iron building, three-sided. He had some of these and he went back and he enclosed this building. And so I think building some of these, it leaves you the optionality to turn an unenclosed covered spot. And again, you can build these for 
15, 16 dollars a square foot, and you always have the optionality of enclosing that building and renting it out for more money by adding another door on this side or adding another wall with a bunch of doors. He didn't even partition it. it you know, you go inside one of the doors, you can access all of the units there, which I thought was a really cool um, value add that he had done to that and optionality to build it out and kind of see. So if I were to build the perfect one, I'd build a little bit of everything, see what did best and expand out from there um, would be my strategy. If I could do it, I would only have boat and RV storage customers because your percentage of delinquency is so low. These people put their credit card on auto payment. You won't hear from them for six months and you just don't have the traditional struggles of self-storage you know, with self-storage tenants in some markets that you do with these boat and RV people. These people are always paying their bill. They're always worried about, I need access to my boat. I need access to my RV. You know, so uh, if I could have it my way, I would do only these because um, I think they're great. The downside is you got to have big parcels, which we all know big parcels with the right zoning are hard to come by. And that's another thing with these is even these, these buildings right here, um, this is most places going to be qualified as outdoor storage, which in some markets is not permitted at all and you have to ask for a special use. In some markets it is permitted, but it's generally if self-storage is commercial general or C2, C3, C4, a lot of times this outdoor storage is going to be listed and labeled as industrial, right? So a lot of times you're looking for a different parcel it's in a different part of town. I mean, if you think about the places you drive through in towns and you see self-storage, you're normally not seeing boat and RV storage in that same part of town. You're normally seeing boat and RV storage in industrial parks, right by an interstate, something like that. So the zoning is completely different on these in most markets, which also just makes it challenging. So, you know, when you're thinking about parcel selection and doing this, your first question is, is the zoning right for me to, to take advantage of, of renting this out? So what you're saying, if you're already running self-storage, then that therefore grandfathers in the parking? Is that right? 25%, yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah. And you, and you know, you, if you're full on, on self-storage, you'd rather fill that space with self-storage, but if you're building out in phases, it could be a great way to produce revenue uh, in the meantime. And I've also, I think you mentioned a, a key word there. You said you can build it inside of your self-storage, right? Oh, on the same site. See, I've seen different governments say you can do it as long as you can't see it from the road. So a lot of governments are worried about the optics of rundown trucks with campers on the backs. Uh, this facility right here, when I bought it, there was a pontoon boat on the ground, no trailer. He's still there today and has never missed a payment. Boat has not moved, right? So it looks like absolute trash. He's paying money. I think governments are really worried about the optics of that. We've all seen trashy boats, trashy RVs, um, you know, that are just an eyesore. And I think that's a lot of government's hesitation. So you may see people say, hey, you can do it as long as you've screened it with, you know, a fence with a screen on it, six foot high landscaping, um, whatever it may be. In this other facility here, uh, the government made me put a, um, this place, I don't know if I have a picture of it, it was already chain link fenced when I bought it. They made me take the chain link foots down and put up a PVC fence at the access point because that was one of the contingencies of approving me to build these was uh, they didn't want to be able to see the RV storage from the road, which from a marketing perspective, you're like, this is no good. Uh, but you put up a six foot PVC fence, you have a 13 foot tall RV, people kind of get the point, so. So the question is, do you build all of them at the same height? I think these right here are uh, 14 foot low eave. You will see people with RVs. I think 13 foot is the standard, but you'll see RVs that are uh, 12 and a half, 13 foot tall. And some people will have GPSs on top of them. They'll have their AC units on the top. And so that is a consideration is how tall. I had, didn't have anybody that say they couldn't fit in a 14. I think if they have a custom RV with some you know, equipment and gear on top, it may want to be higher than that. Uh, but these right here are 14 foot low eave at this beam right here. That's a good question. On the water, how do I regulate it? No, just one, it's just like a, a general common area where you can go just one spigot on the property. I've seen people, I've seen facilities with like two different wash stations, but I think one is, is sufficient. Yep. 
I've seen some other cool amenities, like if you're looking to do this, people love ice stations. You know, like if you have an ice, hey, if you're a customer here, get free ice whenever you want it. I've seen air compressors, fill up your tires while you're here, water, dump station. Um, out west, I haven't seen any in Georgia or Florida, but there are facilities that build uh, full car washes, you know, like the DIY car wash where you put in the quarters and you do it yourself. I've seen facilities that have built that in their facility, and then they actually have like stairs that will take you up to 10 feet so you can get up there and wash off the top of your RV because they'll grow a lot of mold up there. So those are some of the different cool amenities I've seen, but I've, I've never seen anybody put a spigot at each individual. Electrical, yeah, yeah, 30 amp at least, yep, yep. Hayden, probably be around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. Thanks, guys, appreciate it.